This is All About Bitcoin, a show dedicated to all things, questions and markets related to Bitcoin. Little B for the currency and Bitcoin, big B for the network. A collective journey to understand, apply and use this innovation, all Bitcoin, all the time. I'm your host, Michael Casey, filling in for Christine Lee this week. So let's check in on the Bitcoin price, the Coindesk Bitcoin price index, the XBX, is currently at 48,677. That's up a couple of percent on the day. Uh, pretty much uh, looking a little better at the moment for where it was yesterday. Stop stories in the news today. Twitter may soon enable users to tip content creators using Bitcoin. This is according to a report by Mac Rumors. Code in Twitter's latest beta code in uh, Twitter's latest beta suggests support for Bitcoin will be rolled out to the platform's tipping service that was launched in May this year. The update indicates that users will be given a tutorial in Bitcoin, including details on the Lightning Network and custodial versus non-custodial wallets. It also tells users that a strike account is required to use the feature. SEC Chairman Gary Gensler voicing his crypto concerns once again, this time during a virtual meeting today with members of the European Parliament. Gensler described crypto as a $2.1 trillion asset class that is truly global with no borders or boundaries, operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He highlighted two areas of particular concern for the SEC, crypto trading and lending platforms and stablecoins. Regarding the platforms, he said there's no broker between them and the public. Absent clear investment protection obligations, he said, the investing public is vulnerable. With regard to stablecoins, he pointed out much crypto trading occurs between a stablecoin and another token. Thus, in his view, stablecoins may facilitate those seeking to sidestep a host of public policy goals. As he put it, joining us now to discuss is SEC Commissioner Hester Pearce. Welcome, Com uh, Commissioner Pearce. Good to see you again. Michael, it's great to be here. I have to start, of course, with my disclaimer, um, which is that the views that I represent are my own and not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. It's good. Well, I think our, our viewers are quite used to that disclaimer now. So uh, very glad to get that out of the way. Um, listen, uh, one of the things that stood out to me in uh, the chairman's comments there was the focus on trading and lending platforms, which has become this sort of big burgeoning industry, really, uh, alongside Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, what do you think are the areas of concern there? Well, I mean, I think there are potential implications for a lot of the activity in crypto um, with securities regulations. And I think that that's something that we all think about. One of my particular concerns is that I think a lot of people are innovating in areas outside of the security space because, precisely because we haven't provided the clarity we should be providing. Yeah, you've, you've been on this point for a while, and I think it's a, a very strong one. Um, you know, I, I, the, the chairman in recent comments about, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, was took issue with the idea that the SEC has not been forthcoming and that they've been very clear on what their, their uh, position is on, you know, largely through some of the commentary that's happened since the ICO boom. But you're saying it seems not enough. Can you elaborate? What, what more should the SEC be doing in terms of guidelines and, and clarity? Well, one area where where the chair and I, I think, don't see eye to eye is, is the lack of clarity around when something is or is not a security and what actually is the security at, at issue when we're talking about these token offerings. So I do think that we could provide some more clarity in that space. Um, I think we could provide more clarity around custody uh, of digital assets by broker dealers, investment advisors, and others in our space. Um, and, and just more generally, we could provide clarity around how these traditional entities can interact um, with digital assets in a way that's compliant with the existing regulatory structure. Um, and then, of course, we haven't provided clarity around exactly what it is that needs to be done to you know, create a fund, whether that's, that's an exchange-traded fund or some other kind of exchange-traded product. I think the chair has started to provide some guidance on what he'd like to see in that in that uh, way. But we have a lot more work to do to make it clear that we want to interact with people within our regulatory ambit who want to interact with digital assets. 
I, th I think clarity would be something greatly welcomed by this industry. Um, the chairman, in his comments to the Financial Times uh, today as well, talked about you know bringing the industry under a regulatory framework, which you know I think sounds appropriate. I think people would recognise, obviously, that clarity uh, uh, around the, you know, the legitimisation of, of a clear set of rules as well is ultimately good for an industry that is looking to uh, expand. Um, but I mean, you've raised concerns about sort of excessive burdens as well, I think, um, on startups in this space. So the real, you know, the devil is in the details as to what that regulatory framework looks like. And I think, you know, you had your proposal for a safe harbour idea, giving people some, some room, I suppose, to um, move forward with their developments before these issues come to bear. Um, can you, first of all, elaborate a little bit on that, but also how receptive are your fellow commissioners to this idea? It hasn't had much of a mention in, in Gary Gensler's comments. Not yet. I'm still hoping. Uh, so the safe harbor idea is intended to, to address one of those areas of lack of clarity. I think there's lack of clarity around when a project is trying to do a token distribution event. Um, how do the securities laws interact with that? And I think there is some ambiguity around that. So what I would suggest is that we create a framework to ensure that these projects are providing the information that buyers of these tokens want to have to assess whether or not they want to buy them or not. Um, and make sure that that information is relevant and updated and so forth. And then at the end of a three-year period or before that, if the project is ready and the network is, is decentralized, you could sort of wash your hands of the securities laws and move on. Um, I think the big barrier to getting my colleagues interested in this is this question of whether or not there is lack of clarity and if there is clear, even if there is clarity, and we think all of these things are securities, which some of my colleagues I think do, and again, I can't speak for them, but you know, it seems to me that, that that's the stance that some of them are taking. Does it make sense to apply our existing securities regulations as is, or is there some, some adjustment that we can make, not only to make it um, less burdensome, but really to make sure that those those regulations are producing the kind of information that buyers actually need about tokens. So that's what I think would make sense for us to do. But um, I, you know, I, I, I think my colleagues and others need to hear more from other people saying that there's a need for something like that. You know, just looking at um, the chairman's comments uh, in towards the European Parliament uh, today, he, he's highlighting things that to some, uh, my, the crypto sector at least be considered a feature and not a bug, right? The, the absence of certain intermediaries um, and you know, the idea that stable coins can be traded directly with another, another token, there's efficiencies in that. There's a whole lot of reasons. In fact, it's designed to do all this. I, I suppose, I mean, is there any concern that, by, that, that there's not a sufficient understanding of the real benefits that could come from disintermediation and you know, the, 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 the real power potentially of blockchain? How, how well do people both within the SEC, but broadly in Washington, understand the potential as a, you know, in addition to the risks here? Well, Chair Gensler certainly understands the technology and has been thinking a lot about it. And I think because he spent time at MIT, he was surrounded by people who really did appreciate the value of the technology. And I think he does too. Um, and I think there are a lot of others at the SEC who do understand the technology quite well. Um, of course, you know, I find this topic to be one that's immensely interesting and, and I'm constantly learning new things and find it quite difficult to stay, um, I, I won't say on top of, but even to, you know, run behind this, this set of topics. So I think for people who spend less time, it's probably more challenging. Uh, but I, I do fear that in all of the conversations, we sort of come to it with our glasses on of you know, this is the financial world that we've known for so long. It's one in which we have lots of intermediaries, many of which are quite large and have been around for a long time and with which we're used to, to interacting quite frequently. And when someone comes and says, hey, I found a way to do some of these things without having this big central, central party there in the middle of the transaction, it's a bit scary for us as regulators. Uh, and, and so I do think it's important to emphasize some of the value that can come from, you know, the greater resilience of a system that's not dependent on, upon one or a few large intermediaries. 
um, and you know the the greater potential for people to um, be very engaged with their own financial lives, which can come from these peer-to-peer transactions. Is this going to be for everyone? No. I mean, we're still going to have intermediaries, I'm sure. Um, But I think we shouldn't fear when there's something new on the horizon to really say, okay, let's think about how to regulate this effectively. Let's think about where regulation makes sense. As you mentioned, I do have some concern about over-regulating in a space where you've got Um, people trying new things and really experimenting. I think we have to be careful not to squelch that innovation. Um, But, you know, also let's have a conversation as a society about what we think the right level of regulation is. It's good to have those conversations periodically, and this is a wonderful opportunity for us to do that. Do I think we're going to end up in a place where there's no regulation? Of course not. Um, But I think it makes sense for us to sit down and have a serious conversation about this and not just assume we're going to jam this thing into the existing mold that's been around for, you know, almost 100 years. You know, I should, I should point out as well that I, I actually spent quite a bit of time with, with Gary Gensler at MIT and I concur with you entirely that he understands this technology deeply um, and, uh, you know, absolutely wants uh, the best for for. for the economy to come out of it. There's obviously very broad opinions on, on how to take it forward, though. And, um, you know, one of the things that he's been talking about, and, and, and I think it's come up quite a bit, of course, is where decentralised finance fits into this, right? There was this understanding amongst some, perhaps a naive one, that because they are decentralised and they have, you know, governance tokens and there's no clear leader of these projects that they would be exempt from security laws. It does look as if now uh, they're in the crosshairs can you play out what this looks like? You know, what, what, what may, should the DeFi community be concerned? What, what is the likelihood of a regulatory approach being going to be for a sector that it does find it very hard to identify who's in charge in these cases? Well, I think that the DeFi community does need to pay attention to what the regulatory structure is. Um, one issue that I think the DeFi community needs to confront is DeFi means decentralized, and if you're actually centralized, then you don't look that much different than our traditional financial system. And so um, I think as projects move along toward more decentralization, they really do present sort of this new challenge for us that we need to think about. Uh, the concern that I have is, you know, obviously it's it's inevitable that something that's growing fast and is as large as DeFi is will get attention. The concern that I have is that we we can't get to a point where we're, um, you know, when if, if it's if it's a smart contract that's out there and people can engage with it, I don't want to be at, at the point where I'm going after the developer of that smart contract. Um, I think we need to be very careful there that we're not trying to regulate software development through um, our securities laws, which is a point that others have made, and I think it's a really important point. I mean, these are these are really fundamental um, things that people want to do, and I think we have to be very careful how we approach them. All right. Well, that's what I have time for, unfortunately, Commissioner. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. That was SEC Commissioner Hester Pearce. Coming up next, Bitcoin Markets Analysis with Galen Moore. The chart of the day is brought to you by Crypto.com, the world's fastest growing crypto app. Time now for the chart of the day, featuring this chart, courtesy of Coindesk's research team, showing that of all the Coindesk top 20 assets had positive returns in August, excluding the top two stable coins. Bitcoin, as you can see, is all the way at the bottom in 18th place, but it's still delivering a respectable 12.1%. Cardano's ADA takes the top spot with a whopping 108% return. We'll see how long that holds. 
So Bitcoin investors who bought BTC at the beginning of the year have so far received a 61.2% return on their investment. So for the long term, it certainly has continued to be a pretty positive result. Okay, Galen Moore, Coindesk Director of Data and Indexes, joins us now. Hello there, Galen. Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me. So uh, I understand it's your birthday, so happy birthday for one. Oh, thank you. I was hoping you wouldn't mention it. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I'm just being put in my ear. I didn't even know. I'm so sorry for not uh. getting, sending, sending you that card this morning. But I'm now told, happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that was, a, that was a really dramatic chart there, right? You know, these altcoins yeah. outperforming entirely. Um, you know, what's going on here? You know, I think, Michael, when you see a chart like this with Cardano and XRP in the top three, that is certainly an indicator of retail froth. Uh, Polkadot's run may be a similar indicator, but in, in my mind, to a lesser degree. Uh, so, so certainly kind of a, a, a uh, at least for the month of August, um, retail investors getting excited, I think, is a, is the takeaway from this chart. Uh, okay, uh, mean, mean, and break that down a little bit. I mean, why, why in particular those ones do, do they lead you to, to draw that conclusion? Uh, you know, I, I think um, when it comes to ADA and XRP, uh, you know, look, there are projects that certainly are, are in that kind of category that are attracting the interest of institutional or professional investors, but I think um, those are not. Uh, two of them, ADA in particular, right, which is a smart contract platform. Um, you know, I think, especially when you look at what's happened with ETH over the past month, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Bitcoin, you can see the the rise in the legitimacy of ETH for the uh, traditional investor. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, EIP-1559, the Ethereum uh, upgrade that uh, took place uh, this quarter, you know that that has been, I think, a tremendous success. It's shown uh, that if, that Ether can duplicate or co-opt some of the features of Bitcoin. I'm not sure that Taproot, which is Bitcoin's uh, sort of uh, equivalent uh, or similarly timed improvement, uh, I'm not sure it goes the the same way. Um, so, you know, when you see that kind of rise of Ether, you're, you're bound to see projects that are similar to Ether kind of getting some benefit from that. But when it comes to institutional investors, I'm not sure that uh, Cardano is one of them. Yeah, we had a guest on yesterday talking about this as well, the, the idea that uh, there is institutional interest now growing in things like, like you know, Ether, for example, and perhaps not Cardano, but certainly Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what evidence do we have of that? How, uh, how much participation? Are they, are they still largely on the sidelines? Are they coming in? What's our outlook for institutions generally? You know, I think, I mean, so much of it is anecdotal, uh, but there are a couple things you can look to to sort of try to create a narrative around predicting or explaining how a professional investor might behave. One of them I think that's been really important over the past uh, two months has been the existence of alternatives to buying Bitcoin in the spot market. Uh, so you still have the uh, GBTC uh, discount at uh, about 15% to NAV uh, earlier today. Uh, it's been in the double digits, in and out of the double digits uh, for some time. And, uh, you know, that that's obviously accessible to both retail and institutional. But I think, you know, you have to look at that as a factor that depresses the price of Bitcoin or its potential to rise in any case. And then the other factor is the China mining crackdown, which uh, sent crashing the price of mining equipment. So for investors with large pools of capital, for large investors, you have this kind of mining alternative and you do see pickup there. The price of mining equipment has gone up, hash rate has gone up. And I think those are indicators that, that institutions are not, you know, per se, sitting on the sidelines. Uh, but I do think that perhaps um, some of their entrance into the market may be uh, going into assets like Ether and going into things like mining, which, of course, you know, have uh, sort of maybe an indirect effect at best on the price of Bitcoin. All righty, that's what we have time for. Unfortunately, Galen, thank you so much for joining us today on All About Thanks Bitcoin. Kayla Moore, Director of Data and Indexes here at Coindex. And that's it for All About Bitcoin. I'm Michael Casey. Join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in New York for First Mover, your first look at the day's global crypto news headlines. You're watching Coindesk TV. Bye for now.